Hi everyone, welcome to episode 93 of our journey together through the book of Genesis in season two of the Bible Project podcast. And I've called this morning's, we're starting a new section together and it's an introduction to Abraham. And over the next few episodes, we'll be working through the beginnings of the Abrahamic stories. And the text we're going to cover today by way of introduction is Genesis chapter 11, verses 27 to 32, which say this. This is the account of Terah's family line. And Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees in the north of his birth in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abraham, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. But when they came to Canaan, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. So as we progress together through this next great section of the Bible, we shall see, in a sense, God stepping back, so to speak. The individual personalities of the human characters that are, are, that are involved now are going to become more and more developed for us. What I recognise in that is God promoting the importance of individual responsibility. And he develops that through the sacrificial system, because through that we will see God step away slightly as he allows people to step forward and make atonement for their mistakes. Now, Abraham, who's going to be introduced in some detail over the next few days, is a very well-developed character. History, as many understand it, seems to start to hear with the story of Abraham. And the stories of, uh, that we are going to read, they sound, even to the modern ear, like historical stories. The narrative now will include a variety of stories in which Abraham is seen to act on his own initiative. And that's slightly uh, different to how God related in the earlier stories of Noah and other people prior to the flood. Abraham is seen to take responsibility, and but also face the consequences of when he gets things wrong. One of the things that really struck me about reading these stories and preparing this series this time is just how much it's like a warts and all story about a real person. Abraham is not really a, defines, a divine figure in any sense. I mean, he has archetypical elements, of course, because he's the founder of a nation. But fundamentally, we can recognize that he's a human being, just like you and I. He has adventures. He makes the mistakes that any of us could make. And it's the mistakes that become the really important part of the story. Despite of the fact that he engages in some almost, one might say, deceptive practices, he's seen overall and recognised as a good man. He's not a perfect man by any sense of the imagination, but things will still work out for him okay in the end. As we know, he will become the founder of a nation, a great nation, a nation that will become God's people in the sense that God will use them to carry forward his salvation history. The good news, this is good news for everyone. And you know why? It's because perfect people are pretty far, hard to find in real life. You see, if the only pathway to having a rich and meaningful life was through some sort of perfection, then of course we'd all be in deep trouble. And it's very satisfying to read that, isn't it? That an ordinary person can be used by God. The other thing that I've been struck by is the fact that Abraham, and I believe this is one of the keys to the interpreting these stories, is he is seen to go out and do things. He does stuff, and the repercussions of it aren't always positive. Now, I think it's helpful to, to say it's useful to surround yourself with people who are helping you to try and move forward in life, and more importantly, with people who are happy 
when you move forward in life. They celebrate it with you. And people who are not happy when you move backwards. When you do destructive things, your friends shouldn't be there to cheer you on because they're not acting like friends if they do that. This is really important. It should be obvious to everyone, but it's clear to me that that's not the case for a great many people these days. What happens at the beginning of these Abrahamic stories at the most basic level is God comes to Abraham and says, go, get going, get out there, do stuff, do something, live your life. And when he sends Abraham out, he doesn't send him to a place of plenty. Ironically, it seems he is sent to a place where he faces famine and starvation and tyranny. And there are deceitful people there who wish him ill will. In fact, you might say, that's just like you where you and I live right now, today. So isn't this a useful story then? Abraham, Abraham, or Abram as he's called at this point, ends up having to sojourn in Egypt and live in a world of tyranny and of deceit and of vulnerability. And yet God still says, go, go out, because if you do go, Things will happen, great things will happen, and you will become the father of the nations. You'd have, th you'd have thought on a human level, if we were planning this out, then and we were being sent out, that God would have, we would have wished to have sent us immediately out to a land of milk and honey. But that isn't how it's going to happen for Abraham at all. Yet, even through these challenging stories, his mission is still regarded as divine and that is because he will grow in God as he encounters life's complicated difficulties. And these are archetypical representations of the things that everyone will and should encounter. What is basically being said here, I believe, is something not that different to what is said in the Sermon on the Mind, which is that if you align yourself with God's will, and you pay attention to the divine order of things as God has presented them to you, then you can operate and live in the midst of chaos, in the midst of tyranny, among great deceptions, and yet you can still flourish, flourish spiritually and flourish in your relationship with God. Thus, this coming narrative of Abraham develops the personality and the character of an individual within this narrative story by picking, picturing him as a person with a new God-given degree of responsibility. Now, I read an article in the Spectator magazine a couple of years back, and it talked about the fact that people today are fed this unending diet, this unending diet of their rights and their freedoms and yet even with that diet people are still hungry they're still struggling aren't they people are starving for an antidote for the meaningless of life well the antidote that's revealed here in these coming abrahamic stories is one about choosing to live in the real world but flourishing by by living in love and truth and importantly by accepting responsibility that, I believe, is the secret to living a truly meaningful life. Without that sort of life, without a meaningful life, all around you becomes suffering, nihilism, self-contempt, despair, despair, and all that that brings. And clearly that's not good. And that's what we see in the world around us. And that's what we see in the hearts of people around us, isn't it? It's soul deadening. It's an anti-human way to live right to the very core of our beings. Instead, this tells me that if you are able to go out there and try and reveal the best of yourself to the world, then you can be an overwhelming force for good. Presenting the world with the best of you in service to the best of that which there is in the world. Whatever m mistakes you might make along the, the way, this tells me that God will wash it all out in, the life, in a life where you live a life of service, sacrifice and responsibility. Abraham is not going to be a perfect person by any stretch of the imagination. He's a real person, he makes mistakes, but it doesn't matter in the overarching narrative 
It is living out the promise that God has made him. And we too can live out the promise that God has made for us, despite our inadequacies. And this tells us that if we do that, we'll not only prevail, but listen to this, our descendants will benefit also. Isn't that really good news? And I'll just uh, continue reading the text to give this transition through the chapters for you. So beginning at verse 29 and reading through to the, just the first verse of, of chapter 12, which says this, Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarah and the name of Nahor's wife, that's uh, Abraham's brother, by the way, was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarah was childless because she could not conceive. Then chapter 12 says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, there's a famous quote by the playwright Anton Chekhov when he was talking about the staging or the setting of a play. And he said that this, if there's a rifle hanging on the wall, you can be sure it will not be long before the second act when it will be used. And if it's not, it shouldn't have been hanging there in the first place. And I would suggest that in this closing section of chapter 11 and the opening of, that, of verse 12, there's some biblical stage setting going on here. And we're going to get some more stage setting in on this passage over the next few days. You see, part of what's going on here is the Bible is telling us about Abraham's wife and the fact that she's barren to sort of set in our mind just what a catastrophe that is for Abraham and Sarai, particularly in the light of the promise that was given to them. It's showing the trouble that they're going to have and it's setting that out for us right at the beginning of the story. Now, there's a fairly straightforward message contained in this passage, and it's this. Uh, in this passage we're going to look at is God wants to bless you. In fact, God elects, God chooses to bless anyone who will turn to him, follow his will. And for us, that means turning to him in repentance and faith. So Abraham and Sarai receive a promise, one where he is seen to be blessed and will have a long and fruitful family line through which he will be recognized as the father of the nations. So what is the inheritance that we are promised by God? And what must we do to be blessed? When you start reading the Bible, you don't have to go very far before you discover that God is seen to choose, to elect, to bless particular people. We saw it with the story of Noah and the flood and how God blessed him. And in that case, it was dramatically removing him from the judgment that was coming. Now, I believe if we understand these early biblical stories, then we can see again and again that God is choosing to bless those people who follow him. Often, before we are introduced to the people, the opening line of any particular passages is so-and-so walked with the Lord. So God wants to bless those who are on that journey of faith and obedience with him. So what we're going to do now is take the next section of this book in Genesis over the next few days and see how God called and blessed this man called Abraham, who was obedient to him. And for that, we need to cover the text, which covers the end of chapter 11, which I've just read. And we're going to be looking at the first eight verses of chapter 12, probably over about four podcasts. So I'll just remind you of what the close of chapter 11 said. It said, Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. And she was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. And then it tells us, importantly, now Sarah was childless because she was not able to conceive. The chapter 11, the tail end of the previous chapter, tagged on to the end of the genealogy, is that overview, a background of Abraham and his family line. But chapter 12 will tell us about how God is now calling Abraham and how he will confirm that call. We were told at the tail end of chapter 11 that Abram was originally based in Ur of the Chaldees, and it will be confirmed later for us in the Bible 
the Ur of the in, in the book of Joshua, in fact, that Ur of the Chaldees was a place that was filled with pagan island, uh, idols. Ur was, in fact, a center of religious idolatry in the near Middle East at that time. So we start out by saying that Terah, that's Abraham's father, remember, is not someone who worships the Lord God. He's a moon worshipper and a worshipper of idols. And the end of chapter 11 tells us that about him. And it tells us about his three sons, one of which is Abram and one of Abraham's brothers, who we will, we will find out later will become the father of Lot, who is seen initially to accompany Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan. They get, but they get as far as a place called Haran, and then they stop. They stay there for a while and then they leave and then they make their way into what is today is called uh, the part of Israel that is referred to as Palestine. But Terah doesn't make it all the way. He only gets as far as Haran and then it tells us that he dies. So this brief section preceding chapter 12 is there to demonstrate that Abraham came from a pagan idolatrous background now, the reason for telling us these facts is simple. I think it wants to demonstrate that there's nothing about Abraham that would particularly mark him out as an important figure, not certainly not the important figure he will become, and there's nothing about him that warrants God's special call on his life. But also telling us that there may, signalling for us that there may be trouble ahead because his wife is seen to be barren, unable to have children. So that's the background. Well, we'll pick up the story at this point in the next episode because things get very important from this point forward as what happens is what the Bible experts refer to as the call of Abraham, a enormously important point in the Bible for all of us from here on in. Now you remember last time when we introduced this section, we were told that Abram was originally based in this place called Ur of the Chaldees. We also discovered at that point that Ur was in fact a region, a centre of idolatry. The brief section that preceded chapter 12, those verses we read at the end of chapter 11, were given in order to demonstrate that Abraham came out of a pagan idolatrous background. But today we're going to pick up the story of chapter 12 and his specific call. And this, my friends, is very important. This is one of the key points in the Bible. Chapter 12, verse 1 tells us, The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. When Abraham was first called, remember he was living in Ur, which had been described earlier in Genesis as a beautiful, luscious land. Now, in ancient time, Ur was a seaport which sat at the head of an estuary, which was enriched greatly by trade that was moving through it. There were also two great rivers by uh, feeding through out from Ur, and that was the Tigris and the Euphrates. They were nearby, they bordered the whole area of the estuary, and they watered the ground, which produced rich soil, which was great for producing really abundant crops. Historical records show that corn, apples, grapes, pomegranates, all grew, grew and grew naturally in the wild in that area. So this is a really fertile area comparing to the neighbor, neighboring Arabian desert, which lies inland and to the east. So the question you might be asking is why have I brought up the nature of the city? Because I'm needing to point out to you that this is the place that God tells Abraham to leave. Ur was a great place to live, but God still says to Abraham, you've got to get out of town, my friend. And he also says, I'm not going to tell you where you're going, but just obey me and do that. And he leaves, he leaves that great city and he sets off without even knowing where he's going to. No wonder we might say he's called the father of the faithful. Doesn't this demonstrate that? In the Abrahamic stories, one of the things that maintains Abraham's promise with God is his continuing, his continual willingness to sacrifice. And this sacrificial issue is important. It tells me today that you and I are not really committed to something unless we're willing to make a sacrifice to do it. 
for, for it. Cons commitment and sacrifice are completely interlinked. Some might say they're almost the same thing. So God here calls Abram to leave Ur, and in doing so, God then comes and makes several promises in the verses that follow. Verses 2 and 3 say this, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on earth will be blessed through you. Now, we're going to look at these promises in the next episode. But basically, he commands them to leave and go to a land he's never even seen. But if you do that, God says, if you go to that land, you're going to be blessed, regardless of how the situation may look to you at the moment. Now, you may have noticed that when I read those verses of the blessing, the word you appears seven times in those two verses. But within that, there are three types of promises here. There is the individual promise to Abraham, and then there are the promises concerning his descendants, who will become a nation. And then there are also some universal promises given to, a to Abraham, through which all of us, there is the potential to bless everyone, all the people on earth. Let's look at the promises for a second, but just the individual promise this episode. And the first is that God promised to bless Abraham and to make his name widely known. And he promises to bless others through him. And he promises to bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. And by doing so, he will make Abraham's name great. Well, clearly, when it comes to that initial promise of making Abraham's name great, that is that the fact remains that Abraham is still one of the most well-known names in the world. He is still, to this day, highly regarded by Jews, Christians, and by Muslims. He is honoured in all three of the world's religions, and all of them trace their lineage back to Abraham in one way or another. That, my friends, is the fulfillment of God's promise that he is going to make his name great, well known. He's going to make his name great, and that is exactly what has happened. At the point in Genesis chapter 12, and we'll be covering verses 2 to 5 today, continuing to look at the call of Abraham and the next of the great promises that God made to Abraham that day when he said, I will make you a great nation from out of whom the whole world shall be blessed. Best. We saw last time that God made Abraham three types of promises when he called him out of Ur of the Chaldees. One was that we would make, uh, one was that he would make his name great. In other words, that he would make him famous. And secondly, was the promise to, that he would use Abraham to bless other people. Other people in the world would be blessed through him. This is because God would reveal Himself through Abraham. So that he would make that by doing so he would make himself known to others the lord would be made known through the story of abraham and his subsequent family line so but at this time he will he will become god's servants and in a sense will become almost god's spokesman to his uh, immediate family at that time Abraham is going to be so closely identified with God's plan for humanity from this point forward to such an extent that God even says that anyone who curses him, it's an equivalent to cursing God himself. But that was the individual promise and a national promise is now following on. The national promise is that he's going to make Abraham a great nation. That he is going to bear children because clearly if he's going to become a great nation that means that that's going to happen doesn't it however great doesn't necessarily have to mean large a culture of a nation can be great in ways that are more important than just the number of people that it spawns great means much more than big israel's greatness was not her country was not a contribution of great philosophers like the Greece government or even great methods of government like Rome produced the nation of Israel's greatness would be spiritual let me just remind you that out of Israel will come the Ten Commandments the finest moral code issued in the history of all mankind 
out of Israel will come the entire word of God, the Bible. So there's a personal promise and there's a national promise, but there's also a universal promise in that all the people of earth are going to be blessed through this line. Now this again is not for the first time the Bible is making a clear cut reference to a coming Messiah, Messiah way back here in the beginnings of Genesis. So although Abraham is going to come as a saviour of the world, God has called Abraham and he's given him a promise. That's what we're seeing going on here. But let's see how Abraham will uh, respond. And let's pick up the story at verse 4 and 5. And it says, So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, all their possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So by his actions, Abraham demonstrates he believed God. And this is important because God gives the promise, but he is seen to believe it. And because he believes it, he obeys and he leaves Haran and sets out for Canaan. He did not leave Haran like a migrant that was someone who was fleeing war or famine who, or who was being forced out. He left because he believed God. He believed God's promise. And he then travelled approximately 400 miles of his down to, to Haran. God told him to leave his country and his family and his father's house. But please note that when he departed, he also took something else with him. And that was Lot. Apparently, when Abraham left Ur, he took his father with him too. He subsequently died, we know. But now he leaves Haran and he's taking Lot with him. So that perhaps suggests his obedience at this point was still slightly partial. We will see that his faith and obedience will mature as we move through this story. But at this point, just summing up so far, God said to Abraham, leave your country. And Abraham said, yes. God said, leave your house, and Abraham said, yes, and God said, leave your family. But Abraham, in a sense, said no to that, didn't he? Because he took Lot with him. He believed him and obeyed him, but at this point, only partially. But we need to understand that partial obedience is still disobedience. Remind you where we're up to so far. If you remember last time, God said to Abraham to leave his country, and he said yes. And God said him, asked him to leave his father's house, and Abraham said yes. And then God said, leave your family behind. And Abraham, well, it appears he said no. He believed him and he obeyed him, but only partially up to this point. But some, of course, would say that partial obedience is still disobedience. Well, we're going to discover the consequences of that in the next couple of verses today. And we're just going to pick that up by reading for you Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, which says this. Abraham travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. So the thing to note here is he gets to the land and he discovers that it's not an empty place. It's populated. There are already people living there. Now, I wonder if that gave him pause for thought. Wonder if he felt at that point, you know what, I'd really like some confirmation that I've done the right thing here. Perhaps he also felt that he needed some assurance that he was actually where he was supposed to be. Well, let's read the next verse and see what it says. 12.7 says, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar to the Lord who because the Lord had appeared to him there. Well, doesn't that look like he got exactly what he needed? So there are Canaanites in the land, but this verse 7 tells us that the Lord appears to him and says, Don't worry, this is the land I'm going to give to you. So God has confirmed his call. The Lord clarifies that this is the land and that it is not only the land that he's giving to him, but he's giving to his descendants as well. But of course, we need to remember that Abraham and Sarah I haven't had a son yet. However, the Lord is still clarifying and confirming the promise that he had previously given to them. 
So the big point here is that God called Abraham, gave him a promise, and, and Abraham stepped out in faith. And later when he had doubts, which probably seem reasonable, when he had doubts, God appeared to him and confirmed the promise again. So what this suggests to me is that when God makes promises, he will often repeat them and confirm them to us. And when it comes to his big covenants, he not only confirms them, but he confirms them legally, judicially. In a few chapters from now, God is going to reconfirm that covenant. And the word used for covenant is actually a legal term of that time. He's going to confirm it with Abraham and he's going to do it in a particular way that makes that covenant not only everlasting, but legally legitimate in the way that things were done at that time. But verse 8 gives us a clue to what's going on here and what is to come, which tells us this. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. So that's Genesis, that's verses 8 and 9. So he builds an altar to the Lord, which means he responds with a sacrifice. That's what the building of the altar means. In the Old Testament, when the Lord gave a promise to his people, the people would respond and confirm it by making a sacrifice, usually, of course, a newborn lamb. But in the New Testament, though it says we too still have to make a sacrifice, the so sacrifice we offer is something other than a lamb because a perfect lamb in Jesus Christ has come and made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf already. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 that one of the sacrifices that we must make is a sacrifice of praise. And in fact, in Philippians chapter 4, you could say that we're given a further adage that we are required to give a sacrifice of our financial resources in response to what God has done in our lives. But anyway, so Abraham, he builds an altar, he makes a sacrifice there, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is an interesting expression. It's primarily referring to prayer, but Bible experts who study this passage say the words used say it, ref it also refers to an element of proclamation, speaking out in praise of what God has done. So Abraham's sacrifice involves praying, but also proclaiming the name of the Lord. Now today, what that tells me is it suggests that our response to God should also be about proclaiming about what he has done in our lives to other people. Personal evangelism, you might call it. The Lord promised to make Abraham's name great, and Abraham responded by sacrificing and proclaiming the name of the Lord, that the Lord was good for what he said he did. The Lord promised to make Abraham well known, and Abraham promised the Lord that by making his well, himself well known that, and his sealing it with a covenant, he would seal it also with a sacrifice of praise. So that's the call of Abraham. And uh, what I'd like to do finally is to summarize what I believe this whole passage teaches us. So anyway, the call of Abraham and how do we sum it up? Well, when God called Abraham, he called him to be a blessing. And to do that, in order to receive that, Abraham had to respond in faith, obedience, praise, and proclamation. That's what we said last time. So putting this in a very straightforward way, I believe Abraham simply took God at his word. And as a result of that, he was blessed. And, of course, he was then able to be a blessing to other people. So in short, God will bless those who trust him and obey him. That's fairly straightforward, isn't it? Now, this is a very, very important passage of scripture. So I just want to try and make some final observations for us and pull this all together. 
because this, this passage forms an introduction to the great historical development that we will witness that will lead to the foundation of the nation of Israel. The prophecies of the Messiah, the appearance of Jesus Christ, and of course eventually the establishment of the Christian church. You see, God here calls Abraham and he promised to give him a piece of land. And this is what you might refer to as the seed plot of the Old Testament. Because through him and his family line, a Messiah will come. And this is the creation of a record uh, described in the Old Testament, but prophesied and witnessed by the New Testament writers. So this passage and the chapters that are going to follow are the, not only the key to the book of, of Genesis, but they are in a sense a key to unlocking the whole Bible. You see, the story of Abraham is the story of a man of faith. More specifically, though, it is a story of a man of faith who will face many obstacles. As we progress through this book, we shall see each obstacle will test his faith, but it will also provide an opportunity for him to grow stronger in his faith. Each of the barriers he must overcome, but he will have to overcome them with God's help. And each of these problems will constitute a challenge to Abraham's faith in some way or another. Each problem Abraham encounters is typical of problems that every believer will encounter in their life, particularly, particularly if you're seeking to live a life of faith. Consequently, that tells me that each episode of Abraham's life can teach us something, can teach us something about God's power, God's faithfulness, and it can help all of us and encourage us all to live by faith and obedience. Let me just list for you some of the obstacles that Abraham will face over the coming chapters. His wife will be seen to be incapable of producing an heir, though God promises him one. Abraham at one point will have to leave the land that God said that he and his family would inherit. Abraham and his whole family will face mortal danger whilst in Egypt. And Abraham will father an illegitimate child through a concubine, which both threatens his wife's reputation and the legitimacy of this family line. And all these events that occur appear to fly in the face of the promise as the covenant that God has made with him. We will then see that Abraham will have to learn to trust God in spite of all these mistakes, some of them of his own making and some of them external obstacles. In the very next episode, which we're going to look at next time, we'll see Abram go into Egypt. But what's he do when he gets there? He will lie about his wife. And that means that she will almost end up in Pharaoh's bed. So this is not him exactly fully trusting the Lord yet, is it? This is just the introduction. When he start, this is the point at which I said he's starting out trusting the Lord, but with some partiality, but we will see him grow in faith and obedience until his faith is truly mature. Now we believers all have a similar journey, a similar calling to walk by faith and obedience in order to become part of God's program in our lives and in our families and and no doubt his plans in us to bless others and maybe even the whole world. This is the pattern that's been set here. Abraham's example of faith and obedience is therefore a model for all believers, all of us to forsake everything and to try and serve God and thereby become a blessing, a real blessing to others. When it comes to being blessed by God, I believe this passage can teach us three really important things and I'd like to end this passage uh, that we've been looking at by summarizing those for you. Number one, it tells us to believe God. Abraham did nothing particularly special in order to receive the individual promise and blessing. He was not blessed because of his background. He came from an adulterous family, so it doesn't matter what your background is. He also had been a sinner and was a sinner on multiple occasions, but yet still Abraham believed. 
So it always starts for everyone, for all of us, for you and I, with just simply believing and embracing God's promise. Believe that Jesus Christ, God's Son, came and died for you to reserve, resolve and make peace with God for all those things in your life and your background that have gone wrong. Salvation for us too today is nothing more than believing God's promise to you of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Number two, try to obey. Abraham was richly blessed in his life, but that blessing always comes about through obedience, and it's the same for us. Believe and obey. Well, one more thing, and this is super important. We are to bless others. That's what this passage teaches us. Abraham praised God and he blessed the Lord by proclaiming his name to others. So blessing can, of course, and primarily should be doing something practical and loving to help other people. But it's sometimes nothing more than including a testimony of the blessings in your life and crediting God for them. If God blesses you, then you need to make sure that you bless others. Are you the sort of person who, when you arrive in a room, makes everybody happy? Are you the kind of person that everybody's pleased to see and feels lifted when you walk into a room? That's quite a challenge, isn't it? Well, I believe this passage tells us, and I'm talking to me as well, is that we are all to try and become that person in Christ Jesus. When divine favour has been bestowed on us, as it has, it's not just for our benefit. It's meant to be for the benefit of everyone around us. One of my very early Christian mentors in life said, the object of your life now is to always leave people better than you find them. That's a challenge, isn't it? To build everybody up, he said. To build everybody up that you meet, to build them up in Christ. That's a principle that I believe we should always try and keep in the back of our minds as Christian believers. So if you really want to be blessed, perhaps the starting point should be our desire to go and bless others. I'll leave you with that one simple concluding principle. Trust and obey the Lord and, be, and thereby you will be blessed by him and live a life sharing that blessing with others. Thanks for joining me. And I'll see you back here very soon on the Daily Bible Project podcast. Bye for now.